Well, this is not my first rodeo, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everyone for uh, coming to our event tonight. Uh, it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce uh, my esteemed colleague and can I say partner in crime for the past? Of course. God, yeah. when did, how long have we been, work, how long did we work on this book? Uh, remember 2019? Good God. Remember? Yeah. No, I don't. That was like seven years ago, right? Yeah. Anyways, uh, Samantha Garner. And I'm just going to read off the back of her book because uh, the bio is so good that I don't want to uh, devalue it by making up some other stuff. Samantha Garner's short fiction and poetry have appeared in various publications. She lives and writes in Mississauga. This is her first novel. I will add that she also uh, lived in Calgary for nine years. Uh, when when was that? Uh, 2001 to 2010. So I, I moved here sadly um, uh, before Shelf Life opened in Calgary, but I have been there and I'm, it's really cool. So Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I think so. Uh, first things first, uh, you are going to grace us with a reading from your fantastic debut novel, The Quiet is Loud. And yes, this cover is gorgeous. Um, Invisible does beautiful covers and uh, I can't stop staring at this one. So thank you, Invisible. Um, <laughs> thank you, Ryan, for the inter introduction. So, um, and also thank you, Shelf Life and Glass Bookshelf for having us. This is really exciting. And as Brian mentioned, I did live in Calgary for a while and I really love Calgary and I made sure to bring my really vintage, possibly stolen from an old office, <laughs> CBC Calgary eye opener mug for the occasion. So I'm going to read to you a chapter, uh, not chapter, a section from sort of the beginning section of the book. Uh, just a little bit of setup. Um, the main character in The Quiet is Loud Freya is what's called by the slur term Vecker, also known as paradextrous. Um, these are people with enhanced mental abilities and hers is that she has prophetic dreams. To sort of give, um, uh, use her ability to help people and to sort of give it sort of legitimacy, she is a professional tarot reader online at a site called Onera. And in this scene, she is in the middle of uh, a work session and um, a kind of strange character has just asked her for a private reading. And so it's going to begin. I heard the welcome doorbell style notification of private chat starting and I adjusted my posture slightly. I felt that strange little flicker in my stomach again and tried to push it aside. Jay is a, uh, sorry, this person's name is Jay is a Raven in chat. Jay is a Raven's window opened beneath mine in the split screen of the private chat room. Brief graininess as a webcam came to life on the other end. I could make out his features only vaguely, skin slightly darker than my own, short black hair neatly trimmed. His camera was at a high angle. In the background was a framed photograph of a field of winter trees and on a low bookshelf, three burning candles. Candles, seriously? This isn't the craft. But I put on a smile and said, hi there, can you hear and see me okay? Yes, hello. The voice was clearer than the image, which was lucky. It was hard to do a good reading when I couldn't hear them. I see you have more than enough credits in your account for a private reading, so we can start if you're ready. What can I help with today? He was silent a moment, staring right into his webcam, and I felt a bubble of suspicion in my stomach. Too many men thought of Onera as a hippie version of a sex chat room. I was about to insist that he say something when he did it on his own. Before we start, do you mind if I ask you about your readings? I began to relax. His voice was hesitant, but kind. He didn't seem like he was going to demand anything salacious. Sure. Well, the basics are that I've been reading tarot for about five years. I've always been intuitive, and the cards help me tune into people's vibes, so to speak, and give them advice. What's it like when you tune into the vibes? He lifted a mug from off camera and drank from it, like we were friends having a cozy chat over tea. What was it like indeed? I told Jay as a raven the same thing I told everyone else. It's very calm and peaceful. I make myself open to a person's energy and interpret the cards I draw for them. It's very much a two-way street. The better connection I have with a person, the better the cards can help. He was silent again, looking down into his mug. Does that help you understand? I asked. He was paying for this reading, but I still found it annoying when people pulled me into a private chat without any idea of what they wanted to ask. I tried a different strategy. It helps if you have a specific question for me, but 
I can do a more general reading too. So does anything trigger it? He asked, ignoring what I just said. I'm just so curious. What, what is it? Is it the cards? Is it something about the person you're talking to? How long have you been able to do it? Able to do what? I whispered. And then black spots washed over my vision, my own heartbeat in my ears. I tried to click the end call button. It moved and changed color again and again. I chased it with my cursor, bemused. I laughed. How long had Onera's sight been so funny? I heard Jay's or Raven's voice faintly. What's happening now? I wasn't supposed to answer his questions, never answer questions. That's how they get in. You have to hide in plain sight. But his voice was so familiar and soothing. He leaned in close, staring. A loud, repetitive sound, the most irritating sound I'd ever heard. Where was it coming from? I looked over my shoulder and could barely make out a blue jay on the balcony railing, outlined by faint streetlight. Its call sounded exactly like an alarm. Was that what a blue jay sounded like? How fascinating to have one so close. I should record it. I saw that my phone was already in my hand, and in its dark screen through the fog of my vision was my own reflection. I dropped my phone to the floor. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. I think you muted again. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I just point out uh, how how freaking uncanny it is for you to do that awesome reading about a video chat? It is while weird, we're yes. on like the whole time that you were talking about like how 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 um like what what uh what Jay's Raven's uh background was looking at looking like and like how finicky they were about making sure that mm -hmm. I was I was I was. I was so tempted to just look think it thank god it's blurred right because I want to yeah. rearrange everything just yeah. to make sure that I, <laughs> I presented myself perfectly um but speaking of that is actually one of the one of the things that really drew me to uh your manuscript when I first saw it was sort of the uncanniness of it like so so the thing about genre fiction science fiction fantasy but especially science fiction is that is that uh it's so dependent on world building in order mm -hmm. for us to sort of make a connection with it right because unless 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 it's uh reusing themes or or stuff that that we already have sort of a touch point to either culturally or or whatever uh all that context needs to be created uh in order for readers to sort of recognize how they're supposed to be how, how they're supposed to perceive things how they're supposed to feel about things um what you did is very interesting in this book in that it's base it's it's our world it's our world and 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 you like the video call and all of that stuff you hit on it you uh so precisely that like you're never you're never you're never doubting that oh this is this is exactly what our world would be like if it wasn't for the fact that there were people with with enhanced mental abilities running around mm -hmm. Uh, and and then and for some reason that made that made the latter the the fact that these people have these abilities seem like feel more realistic because it was being dragged into our existence and the way people react to them uh, would I imagine be the way people here would react to if someone had I don't know the ability to feel other people's feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found that um, kind of a benefit when researching the sort of society of, of the paradextrous and the way they are in the world, but also it was a little upsetting that how easily I could picture it. <laughs> I didn't really have to stretch my imagination too much, but yeah, it was a kind of a double-edged sword that one, but yeah, I'm glad it was effective at least. <laughs> oh, definitely. I mean, and, and speaking of, of things that sort of made me feel more, I mean, me personally, but I'm sure that, uh, and, and and we get this a lot from readers is like oh this 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 they relate to the story and they relate to the world in ways that that um not not to say that it wasn't expected but because you've created such a rich world that that has so many intersections with our own they're they're relating to it on a personal personal level and not just i like this character right mm -hmm. like like for me the fact that you 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 uh incorporated aspects of your filipino heritage in the book really really spoke to me obviously because i mean uh i'll you know full disclosure when 
your manuscript came to me specifically because I was um, I uh, I was talking to your agent. Shout out to Kelvin, Kelvin Kong. Kelvin. <laughs> uh, I, I was talking to him and 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 I can't remember if I specifically asked for uh, a manuscript by a Filipino author if he had any on his list or if I if I just said straight up, um, you know, it'd be really cool if I could read some manuscripts by Filipino authors. And he mm -hmm. said, well, I've got I've got Sam. Uh, I've also got Terry, but Terry doesn't have anything right now. But I've got Sam. And she's got a manuscript. You want to take a look at it? And um. Uh, and I didn't know what to expect. Uh, and when I got, I think, I think I first, I think, I think on first reading, I described it as X Men if it was real, and you know, sort of humdrum. Yeah, right? like, <laughs> true. Like kind of. Oh, this is not cool. This is not fun. <laughs> this is not changing the world. It's just kind of something you have to live with, you know. But yeah, yeah, the but abilities then, part. <laughs> but then, and but then we got, we were. I was introduced to Freya's character, and 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 the fact that you know she has a Filipino father, and and sort of the way that that his culture and 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 his heritage and, and therefore her heritage is weaved into the novel is really interesting because it's it's not the big it's not it's not the grand although we did we did sort of build that stuff in later just because it's so cool but like it's mm -hmm. not the grand okay this is you know this is who i am this is where i'm from let's let's weave all of that back it's, it, it was more the day-to-day -day stuff like mm -hmm. like oh and you know we had this food and and you know some callbacks to like oh my dad's a bit superstitious and mm -hmm. and for this reason and that right just just the day-to-day -day little that's that's the thing that i was doing some thinking about this like uh one of the things i sort of look for uh in order to re relate culturally to something that's presented in this filipino isn't isn't the the grandiose statements but like you know the day to day i live i breathe this stuff right mm -hmm. like even 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 something even something as superficial as like we had last night's leftovers for breakfast well that's such a filipino thing i didn't realize <laughs> this until i was very old that i mean i should it's not only filipino thing but you know growing up in that culture yeah it's just something i thought everyone did <laughs> so that was one thing that i i really liked about um working with you as well is that it was those everyday things that not only were you encouraging me to put in, but sometimes didn't even really point out, um, which I mean, is, and it makes you sound like maybe you didn't read it, but that's not how I mean it. But like, it's it's just not having to explain it or or, uh, or not having that pressure to make a grandiose statement. Like you say, it's just like, yeah, uh, her dad's superstitious because a lot of Filipinos are um that's just how it is being filipino and um i found that for me that was part of what made it so interesting to write is i didn't have to make those huge sometimes cliche of i'll be honest statements about being filipino that we see in literature especially for someone like me who i'm not fully filipino so not only do i never really feel like i have the authority to make those huge statements but my experience is quite different from a lot of people's and so I couldn't even if I wanted to. Right. But I mean, I think that was the touchstone for me too, right? Because uh, I, I, I mean, I, I wasn't born here, but I, my family immigrated here when I was four and uh, where I grew up, it, there was no Filipino community. It was literally like my uncle's family and my family for the longest time. I grew up around, I grew up in an Italian Portuguese neighborhood. Right. And those were basically my people <laughs> until yeah. until high school. And, and, and I, too, sort of like I can't I, I mean, like, obviously, I live, I breathe. I am Filipino, but but I can't I can't I, I'm uncomfortable making capital P statements about like or capital F <laughs> <Yeah>. statements <laughs> about like like my identity just because like there there is a part of me that that feels uh, I don't, I don't want to say like an imposter, but I feel like there's certain aspects of like other people's experiences that I can't, I can't relate to or claim. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and, and maybe that's, but, but I mean, that's a thing, right? Like the more people I talk to, the more I realize that I'm not, you know, people like we're not actually, there is no universal experience. Like we all experience stuff 
I mean, there are commonalities, obviously, mm -hmm. but but in terms of like uh, our individual experiences, it's it's very diverse and mm -hmm, yeah. And even the, the more people I've talked to um, who are Filipino or have Filipino heritage, I was actually shocked. Like I, I was, ex I was, I th knew that they would, you know, accept the story and, and be happy that I was telling a Filipino story in my own way. But I was actually shocked at how many people came to me and said, yeah, this is exactly kind of what my life is like. And I thought, oh, this is amazing. It actually was not something that I, when I started writing this book, it wasn't something that I expected. I was actually kind of afraid to put in Filipino elements just because I wasn't telling like a story of like an immigrant family or a story of a family in poverty or even really a story where the Filipino identity is a cause of hardship. Um, and so I felt when I started writing this novel, I felt there was a certain sort of alienation like baked into that before I even started. So it was, uh, of course, working with you helped me not think that way, but also after it's been published, it's it's been really gratifying just to see that like every experience of being Filipino is valid and there are so many of them, like you said. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just really cool. And I uh, probably my favorite thing about having written this book, actually, if I'm gonna be honest, so. <laughs> it, it, it is really interesting. I mean, again, like just, I mean, on paper, our I guess our experiences would be very different, and yet we we found so many things that we pointed to in the novel that we I mean, we have oh we had this uh, a, we had this running Google chat uh, during the editorial process. We were just like lobbing ideas back and forth because obviously I'm a huge talker. I can't shut up and using up all the options <laughs> this event right now. But but like I, I I was constantly talking to Sam about stuff, not just in terms of edits, but just in terms of like the conversations that that her book sort of made me want to have about about this aspect of the heritage i mean we had an argument about like what the best meat to do with 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 fried rice was i think and i, st I still i think i think i i think i'm settling on spam <laughs> uh, yeah i mean spam is probably my third place and but i'm always going to go along ganisa if you know i can't i can't do otherwise <laughs> yeah and i'm i'm i'm, I'm I, I have a love hate with Longanisa, but but it's 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 it, it was really there was a lot of joy in working on this book just because as you say uh, there were a lot, a lot of things that um, just sort of I felt in my bones and that was a challenge actually uh, just because uh, we did we did need to I mean. It was a challenge in that, like philosophically, like, and and this is this is a thing that I've 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 um I've sort of tackled uh, working with other other authors from other uh, uh, identities, um, diverse identities. But uh, is is how you know, like, on the one hand, you have to find a way to make their stories sort of relatable to the general readership, but on the other hand, like how much of an explanation do you actually owe them yeah yeah and you can't just be like okay this is this is this is me this is what i do this is how i was raised this is what i believe and that's it like i don't need to translate it for you mm -hmm. which is actually one of the things we talked about uh there is a bit of tagalog in the book and um i can't remember who brought it. i think you might have brought it up and i agreed with you where we didn't want to italicize any of the Tagalog, because mm -hmm. one of the things that we we both believe is that uh, um, italicizing, you know, non English words is pretty othering. For sure, yeah. And we wanted to make it so that, like, you know, in phrase experience, like a word like long silog or tikpalang or you know, rang salamat po would be just in her brain like it's part of a yeah. lexicon just like every other word and so why would it be highlighted as such exactly yeah like i didn't want to you know speaking as like the sort of stand-in for freya like the avatar for freya i didn't want to like other my own life in my own book you know and you're right like we did have conversations about um how much to explain and how much to not and italicize not italicizing was i think it wasn't even a discussion that we 
like we are we started out agreeing on it we started out yeah. on the same page <laughs> that's a, no but yeah so but at the same time it felt like a huge win um because you just it, it is so insidious you just think this is how you do it you just italicize yeah. the non-english yeah. word or, or the the word that's not in the language it's being written in um and when we released ourselves from that stupid expectation it just it was so much richer and deeper for me um to write it and i think i actually ended up throwing in more tagalog words after that because I'm like, yeah, I'm just gonna, it doesn't matter but um but yeah we did have to we did agree that we had to explain lightly explain some things mainly food i think um <laughs> just partly because silog breakfasts are really cool anyway but they they do need they do need explanation it gets a just such a complex sort of um, amalgam of different foods. So you kind of do have to explain it. Um, so I think, I think we found a good, a good balance between not explaining to non-Filipino audiences and, and, and explaining to them. And in a way that I think makes the book more rich and more uh, authentic to our, both of our experiences. I agree. Makes sense, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, no. Um, and you brought up, actually, you brought up before uh, the fact that you wanted to just sort of like in our conversations and in our process, like it sort of encouraged you to incorporate more Filipino elements. Can you speak to, mm -hmm. I mean, not just not just the food, not just the Tagalog, but like there's some there's some big things that you that you brought in. And I know that I have like big uh, I <laughs> like all caps notes that said more of this yeah, in our I Mm -hmm. I think but, yeah. the initial thing I think you were excited about was more mythological stuff because I don't recall how much was actually in there when you got the book actually when you got the manuscripts at first might have been like a light mention or two I can't but, remember yeah I know it, it, it was in there at, at least to some degree um, but yeah you were super jazzed about that I remember and I I was a little kind of hesitant about how to layer it in and I thought, oh, but should it be uh, like in a certain narrative or should there be a conversation that Freya just has with someone randomly? And you're like, no, just just throw it in. It doesn't matter. Just throw it in. <laughs> Put them in. We'll find a place for it. And we did. And I think it um, it isn't about that. Like, I think it would have been, I think it would have been detrimental to the story had we gone completely over the top and and had those elements in there as like not subtext, but the text, it would have been a little, then it would have gone crossed over into that line of a sort of tokenizing the Filipino experience just for the sake of the book. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I think it, it's good the way that we, it's just unabashedly in there, but it isn't done in such an overt way that that is, you feel like it's just shoehorned in just to be in there. So I was really excited about that. Um, and there, on another note, I don't recall if we, expressly talked about this or we just kind of came up in in a one or two chapters that we worked on but so Freya's father who I have to explain to everyone watching is named Brian but with an I and it was completely <laughs> coincidental he was like that before <laughs> before the manuscript came to to the you time. asked me if, you asked me if we should change the name and I was just like whatever who cares let them it let them think of, it's me yeah let them I think mean it's, me. it's a Filipino Brian publishing you know <laughs> yeah there's a there's a funny joke too that um can I point I'll point it out whatever it's uh in the in the uh in the acknowledgments you called me kuya mm. <laughs> which is really which I was which I thought was really really funny because I am actually younger than you yeah but I was using it in the in the more yeah no but that's sense, that's but... <laughs> and, and I was like it, it's just part of the whole I'm I'm apparently I'm your dad thing now. yeah <laughs> anyway <Just> sorry <laughs> but um so so this character brian he um moved to the Phil moved to canada from the philippines when he was an infant and grew up with parents who like many filipinos of his generation just wanted to blend in they didn't they were filipino at home but they wanted their son to be canadian outside the home and, and he was happy to do that but as he grew up he sort of discovered that there were more things about being Filipino that he just didn't know, but he felt like he should um, because his parents were Filipino. He's born in the Philippines. He's fully Filipino and people can tell by looking at him. And this was something I just created for this character without much thought, but 
as we worked together, we developed just him more as a character because we, one thing we, uh, we did was layered in the alternating past timeline narratives. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, we developed Brian so much more. He became this completely rich and more developed character than I ever imagined. And a lot of that was him, you don't even see it overtly, but I, I think, I hope it's clear in the, in, in seeing him interacting with Freya and the things I talk about that he himself is, st is still at his age struggling with what it means to be Filipino yep. in his own way. Um, and that was another thing that, that you were, you were excited to develop as well. And especially uh, this character is a very suspicious character. There's a scene where he is supposed to pick up McDonald's on the way home from work. And he just goes in a, to a different one because he has a bad feeling about the route that he's on. And his his wife, Freya's mother, and Freya are like, haha, dad, you and your bad feelings. But they accept it because sometimes that's what it's like to to have a Filipino person in your life. You know, and that's just that's just one of the wonderful things about being Filipino that I I really think was cool that we got to put in into a character and have him again, not it's not like that's something that he leans on every day. It isn't like, oh. Here's another chapter where Brian has a bad feeling. It was just, just a thing that comes in every now and then, which I thought was great too. Yeah, I got a real laugh out of that just because my mom is the exact same way. It's like yeah. she, if she she'll call me out of the blue one day and she'll be like, "Are you guys okay?" And yeah. I'll be like, What's up? <laughs> and she'll be, and she'll say, "Oh, I had a dream." Yeah. Literally, and that's yep. the only reason. Oh, I had a dream. I mean, to be honest, the specific thing that character Brian does where saying I had a bad feeling is literally from my own actual father so yeah. it was yeah I'm like okay dad that's going in the book <laughs> yeah that and I'm surprised I'm surprised we didn't sneak in everything happens in threes do you know that mm -hmm. one yeah <laughs> happens in threes um it, it's a it's 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 a it's it's a saying that we have in the, when there's misfortune it always happens in threes so if if one one bad thing happens you wait for the two things for the next two things and then it's over yeah until the third thing happens you can't relax <laughs> you think that we combined our powers of filipinoness and like inadvertently did that in the book without realizing we were doing it oh god i'm, I'm probably there's so much subtext <laughs> that's one th that's the one thing that's 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 brought me so much joy and like hearing reader reactions to it and like seeing how people like reading the reviews from people who've read the book is is that is that there's all this stuff that they're pulling from it that I don't remember oh, you yeah. putting in or us talking about uh and I think I mean like it's all there it's all you it's just either I was too like sleep deprived to see it or or again there's just like so many touch points to other people this is what I this is what I meant by like sort of the fact that the story has so many, uh, it interfaces with our world and our lives so richly that like anyone can come in, even if they, if, even if they're not of, you know, Filipino heritage or they don't, you know, suffer from serious social anxiety or, or any of, any of the, the other things that you can personally relate to as a character, there's still stuff that they can find in the book that will say, that's me. Yeah, and um, I think, strangely enough, I don't, like, it's no, another one of those things where I don't know if I did this intentionally, but the the way Freya herself has feelings about her identity and not belonging fully in one place or another, simply because she's half Asian and half white, and then the way that she feels as a paradextrous person, also not fitting into a certain mold or, or having to sort of shift the way she is depending on the scenario or simply just not feeling like she belongs anywhere, I think is sadly quite universal. And I remember in one of our, I think our very first call, um, you asked me either what it was about or if it represented anything, like the whole paradextrous thing. And um, it, I didn't want it to, and I don't think it does, I hope it doesn't, um, because I think that would that would be a little cheap and also I don't want to be like I'd like to be in, weirdly inclusive with Freya's a sense of not belonging anywhere or her struggle with her identity because yeah I just think there's so much universal about just the very grain of that feeling um 
that I mean, like I, I've, I think I've told you before, even just like my feeling I personally have of being half Asian, not feeling feeling like I fully fit in in either, or you know, it was three. There's the Canadian aspect as well, uh, in either um, area, kind of naturally makes me more primed to notice when people can feel left out or or to know what it's like or to maybe write it in a in a good way in a novel. I don't know. I know that might be a bad skill to have or a good skill to have. <laughs> Jury's out on that one, but yeah. Um, so I hope that I hope that's part of why people feel that they can relate to it, which is not, you know, that's not a great thing to relate to, but being able to see your experience represented in in a in a work, even if it's not your exact experience, um, can be quite healing, I think. Well, I, I, I'll just say personally, like speaking personally, that like it, it also helps you feel less alone, even if you weren't feeling alone. But like, I know that just like working with you and having all these conversations with you over the past two plus years, you know, like put me in touch with like a sense of community that I didn't really mm. think I needed or wanted. Yeah, I just, no, I, or I just, I wasn't aware uh was a thing i guess mm -hmm. just being able to to have these casual conversations within the context of something else you know like like it wasn't a big family gathering where everyone's just like but like literally we're just talking about like how to make this book better and the stuff about our common heritage would just slip in and slip out and and it would just be natural to the fabric of our conversations and not like the subject of the conversation yeah, and I didn't, like, you know, I never experienced that before. So, yeah, me too. Like, I, I don't. The funny thing is, I don't often talk about being Filipino with people in in a in a really kind of overt way. Like, my brother and I will sometimes mention, like, we fight over what, what uh, the best nagaraya nut flavor is, for example, or, or he'll like tell me about his latest recipe that he's trying. But yeah, by and large, I don't. I just kind of am out there in the world kind of doing my thing and so it was really cool to be able to have these discussions with you about not just like the book and everything about the book and uh just like little homework assignments like watch the Watchmen tv show <laughs> 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 which is awesome everyone should watch it if you haven't already it's so but, good guys yeah. it's so good um but also just like talking about our you know the Filipino mythological creatures that we remember or mm. our favorites or like why they're represented in certain media in certain ways and stuff like that. It was just, it was a lot of fun. And I felt also too, like it was something I didn't know that I, I wanted to just talk to someone about and I got to, and that was really cool. Mythology. That's a big thing. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, I mean, it's a big thing, but it's not a big thing. If that makes any sense, like yeah. myth, uh, mythologies and mythological creatures do, do, do play a role in in the overall story uh can you speak more to that not just the filipino stuff because you also so so uh not really a spoiler but but freya is half norwegian mm -hmm. she's half norwegian so there is there there are there are elements of norwegian mythology in the book as well and 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 like with the filipino stuff it's, it's dealt in in a very organic way you know, um, they're both stories that are told to her by her parents. And uh, I'm gonna let you speak to that just because. Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it was actually interesting that like Freya as a sort of name and a concept came, I think before anything else in this book. Um, because, so the Norse goddess Freya is, she does have the power to weave fate and she can see all the different strands of fate and kind of rejig things to go a certain way. And um, that when I started this book, it was kind of like, oh yeah, that's cool. What a coincidence. But in working with you on this, I, I developed, like there was the North Miso Miso Norse mythology. What a thing to say, who came up with that phrase? Um, Norse mythology stuff was in there, but um, like with the Filipino mythology, it just, became sort of the background of Freya's life. And also, I mean, she's named after the Norse goddess of fate. Like it, it's kind of a lot to live up to. And so she has spent her childhood kind of thinking about what it means to be this character as if she were 
not she doesn't actually think she's this character but she sort of feels the pressure of the the first Freya um all throughout her life and I thought that was kind of an interesting way to have her think about her her ability in a certain way because it isn't directly a one-for-one one comparison but you can't I mean it, it's there you can't help but draw those comparisons and they are there for a reason but it was it was neat how when we developed that that little backstory about the the Norse mythology stuff how things just kind of came out and made sense like oh yeah she has this like weird burden of being like Freya, the goddess's namesake, and how does that make her feel about her daily life? And how does that affect how she thinks about her ability and, and all these things? And, um, but yeah, incorporating them involved. <laughs> See, the thing about Norse mythology uh, is everyone, like it's everywhere. There, mm. there are different interpretations. Some people can't agree who certain characters were. Uh, they could be this person or they could be this person. So. In a way, it was actually more terrifying to to do the Norse. I was more worried about people's reactions to, to the Norse mythology right. than I was about any other kinds of things I wrote that were Filipino. Because yeah, I have like I'm half Finnish, and Finns don't have that that mythology at all. It's just completely foreign to me. And uh, so I did my best. Um, thankfully, as I said, Norse mythology is kind of a little open to interpretation, so <laughs> I tried. <laughs> Um, okay, going back to the Filipino mythology, uh, we, we did, as you say, uh, spend a lot of time talking about monsters, because one of the things that Freya's dad uh, did with her as a child is tell her folk tales and specifically monster stories. Mm -hmm. uh, was that something that you, I can't remember if, if it was more than a couple of stories in the first draft, or if it was something that we just decided to build on, or if they were all there from the beginning and, and I was just oh, like, I want more. Yeah, they were definitely not all there from the beginning. Okay. I remember that it was mentioned that character Brian had done this. In the okay. Past. And then in developing that, that past timeline and the character of Brian a little more, you're like, okay, put some of these things in if they, if, if you, if they feel organic and if there's a cool way to present it. Um, Where'd you get your monsters? Yeah. They, my dad used to read to me from a couple of books when I was a kid. Um, the first one I discovered when I was writing, it was actually adapted folk tales, So it wasn't, right. they're not real, which is actually kind of cool. I mean, not cool, the opposite. Um, because one of the stories was my favorite childhood story uh, involving a feud between the sun and the moon who had like real bodies. And the, it's really gruesome. The moon got like hung by his neck and then something to do with lie like they threw lie on his face or i don't know it was just it was horrible <laughs> it was my favorite uh, yeah, a lot childhood like that. story <laughs> and so i couldn't put that in because you know it wasn't i mean i probably could have but i, I just I didn't want to put well i didn't want to put something in that was already adapted i guess i don't know it right. felt, felt strange but um i remember uh of course, the the tick balang is is a major one. Um, oh, the but oh, but the nuno is my favorite. So the nuno sapun. So if for people who don't know, is uh, like a little and jump in, Brian, if I'm getting any of this wrong. But he's like a little old man, like kind of tiny, tiny gnome like creature, and he lives under mounds of earth. And when you go over or around his home, you're supposed to sort of ask his permission or just like give him a heads up. I'm coming through. Please don't curse me. Um, and I grew up doing that. Like my parent, my father would take us, my brother and I on hikes through the forest. He'd be like, you better, you better do the thing. So we'd have to go over the hump and say, tabby, tabby, po, no, no, or else he would curse us. And um, that has lodged itself in my psyche such that I, I don't do it now, but I do it in my head. Like I don't say it out loud, but it, it goes in there. Um, so I had to include him in this book or else like what's the point of knowing about him <laughs> right it's, what's what's funny is that 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 creature specifically i think that was the one that triggered me when i was reading oh, yeah. it because i have i have childhood memories of of um my aunt and 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 my mom having having just conversations about uh my aunt claiming that uh no it was actually my cousin uh my cousin who my my first cousin who's actually older than her 
uncle who's my dad so I, I consider her an aunt but anyways yeah. generational stuff my dad was the youngest of nine kids mm. so so yeah there was there was some <laughs> no it was it was it was yeah. it, there, I mean I, I I get it but like there's some trouble deciphering like who's what oh, yeah, generation for sure. on the outside yeah um but but anyway so uh, it was my cousin and uh she 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 would she was telling my mom stories about like how when she was pregnant with uh uh one of her kids about how like a, 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 a very small man in a hat would be following her around and she'd look behind her she'd look behind her and he'd be gone but like you know she'd be like a shopping and then she'd look behind her and like the, mm-hmm. that that small man with the hat would be there and and i and my mom saying oh yeah yeah like your your grandmother my grandmother used to talk all the time about like seeing little men and i swear to god i swear to god i was convinced that my family had a history of being abducted by aliens because of this oh yeah <laughs> and <laughs> and i was like deep into like the x-files and stuff at the time i was like oh no oh, yeah that yeah they're coming worse. for you com- it's generational <laughs> they're coming for, you ne- for me next and and it's so that and but like the fact that like you know these stories are in our blood even if like mm-hmm. we you know we interpret them in a different context because of like you know where we grow up how we grow up um but like even your, your mention of that guy just ticked off all these all these crazy <laughs> alarms in my head yeah things you probably didn't even think were um like noteworthy Speaking or of. yeah see everything yeah. happens we need to we, you need to say the thing because we've been cursed is there a thing for alarms Ah, I don't know. Oh, well, I guess we're all cursed. <laughs> it's part of being a good Filipino. You've got to be cursed at one point in your life, I think. Oh, all the time. Um, um, and tikbalang was, was was a thing I was familiar with, too, obviously. Mm. I, uh, one of the first things, I'm so my parents tell me that, like, I, I could actually read, like, Tagalog when I was younger, when I was, like, three, taught myself. Anyways, but I'm, one of the things I very specifically remember reading was, like, a a horror comic book. Why was, why was a three-year-old allowed to read this yeah. about, like... <laughs> Like um, one of the monsters was Tikbalang, and one the other was um, Manananangal, which mm-hmm. is uh, oh you're you're aware okay so yeah, well, this is story the time for everyone one, I think. okay so so the Filipino vampire is called an aswang and there's a very specific subset of these vampires called the Manananangal uh, and she takes the form of during the day she is um, sort of are, are they young women or old women but seemingly mild mannered yeah. women and at night uh these these monsters um take the true form which is their bodies like the top part of their body detaches from the bottom part so like the legs stay standing uh the top part flies off like they sprout wings and they fly off and and they seek out pregnant women to feed on their fetuses like they they like anyways so I was a three-year-old reading a comic book about this. <laughs> um, yeah, no. If 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 you ever if you if you ever interested in this for whatever reason, uh, if you like horror or just just plain like folk tales, please seek out a Filipino bestiary because we have the mm-hmm. best monsters. Um, Dick Balang is a a, a a trickster character who is a trickster, definitely male- malevolent, but like um sort of like waylays travelers and I, I forget if uh they try to confuse them or whatever yeah and I think um, to get around him you have to turn your shirt inside out and put it back on yeah and you won't get lost <laughs> so so Dick Balang are often described as like bony like humanoid creatures they're like body of like humans and like the head of a horse except all the modern depictions I've seen of this monster have them like, like they're like on HGO, HGH or something, right? So like, I think my, how do I describe them? Bojacked horsemen? Yeah. <laughs> That's literally what they look like. Yeah, like, just, just picture that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like they're supposed to be these wraith-like creatures with horse heads and and, and they're all just like walking into rooms chest first. Yeah. I didn't understand why. <laughs> yeah, it's very strange. I wonder why that's happening all of a sudden. <laughs> it's it's a thing. Um, anyway, so there's a mention of them in the book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's let's steer this back to the book. Um, I, I want to ask you about um, uh, the paradextrous, actually. Um, sure. And and we we definitely had discussions about like how to make the powers work in the world and how to how to sort of make people's reactions to the powers uh, something that felt true to life. But um, uh, I'm I'm curious as to 
uh, what your motivations were for having people with powers in the first place and sort of like uh, why you gave them the parameters that you did, why they were able to do certain things and not other things. Right. Well, yeah, it's actually, I did kind of think at first that Freya would be sort of one and only kind of a, a freak out on her own, but then, then writing her story to me would have felt a little too cheesy, I guess, or too much like some really uh, pulpy horror novel where it's like, she's out on her own against the whole society. And I thought that would, it's not the story I wanted to write. And it also wouldn't have been fair to her for her to be out on her own. I mean, her life was, she's pretty, her, I was gonna say her life is bad enough. Her life isn't really bad, but she already has issues like being out in the world and, and scared of revealing herself accidentally. So I didn't want her to be <laughs> completely all by herself. Um, and for choosing the limitations of the mental abilities, honestly, part of it or a large part of it was because it was my first time writing something like this and I didn't want to have free reign to do whatever I wanted it really. Like I, I came from short stories, so I, I like having a little bit of limitation. I think it's, it's beneficial to the story, but it's also beneficial to the writer, at least it was for me. And I just also love magic systems that have rules and you understand the rules. Like as a reader, it just makes, it's such a much more satisfying experience when you know, oh yeah, this is happening because these things and this, this law that someone said before, this can't happen in this condition, but it can happen under these conditions. Um, yeah, so I want to find things that people could conceivably do in our, in our current society if like, or brains were tweaked just slightly. Um, it might not follow that too exactly. I think there's one character who can um, induce people to believe they've been set on fire. And I don't know how true that or how possible that actually is in our current life and world, but you know, close enough. Also, I felt um, you mentioned like the X-Men influence before and that was always present in the back of my mind since day one. I did not I needed to have a little bit of separation from that as well, just to avoid people making that, you know, oh yeah, it's just like X-Men, not gonna read it, you know? So um, yeah, I guess those were the, the main three things that, that uh, caused me to write them the way I did. Um, so, I, so Sam provided me with a very, very helpful roadmap, sort of like, <laughs> a, how this, uh, the, the, what I love is that I've, I actually haven't followed it like I've been sort of like snakes and laddering uh, all throughout oh, yeah. this roadmap, but like, I don't know, it's great. It's been a very <laughs> good organic conversation, yeah. but um, one of the things I guess maybe we can touch on is uh, marketing. Mm -hmm. How, uh, uh, and did you want to speak about like how, um, how specifically the book has been promoted? Sure. Yeah. So one of the major reasons that I was excited to have my book published with Invisible, aside from, I've been an Invisible fangirl, God, for, I don't know how many years, a lot of years. Um, and not just because of the cool covers, they are beautiful always. Um, but uh, I just knew that, I'm gonna say they, even though you are right here and you are from Invisible, but um, they uh, have always felt very respectful of, all voices, not just the marginalized, but all of them. Um, there, I've never encountered a book or an author from Invisible who I've been like, mm, that was that was not the best thing to do. In fact, it's always been the opposite. I've always been very impressed by how Invisible has has championed all voices in a way that I feel is not harmful <laughs> to people, which seems like you know a very basic thing in our society, but sadly, it's not always the case. Um, and I was really reminded of that in the marketing of this book and even before the marketing, like in the, even in the editing process, because as you know, you were not, you were my main editor, but there was like other lay layers of editing that went on near the end. And as I expected, I didn't feel like my identity was then going to be taken from your hands and put into someone else's hands and warped into something I didn't want. I never worried about that because I knew it totally was not gonna happen and it totally did not happen. 
I think in, in a different world, it could have easily been, oh yes, this is going to be our token issue book, our token uh, person of color book, our token uh, whatever book. Take this element, make it out into like a cartoonish shape, put it on the front of everyone's minds, and then we're going to sell it based on these things that are not actually in the book. And it's been so gratifying to have my debut novel, which is terrifying anyway, to have a debut novel out in the world and have it treated with complete, not just respect, but my, my experience has been centered throughout the whole thing without me even having to do anything. This is the, the wildest thing to me. I never had to ask for it. I never worried about it happening. It just happened. And I mean, as I'm saying this, I, I wonder if a lot of people listening are kind of like, yeah, I mean, that's that's normal, right? But I, it's something that I did worry about when I started writing this book. And, it's, and when I thought of putting in more Filipino elements, um, not so much when I started working with you because by that point I knew I was in good hands. But before that, when it was um, kind of near the end of being finished, I was like, mm, are people gonna wanna read this? I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just, I don't know if that answers your question. I think I went off on this big, like, love bomby rant. It's a, it, it's a great <laughs> tangent. Oh, not rant. I rambling. appreciate it. No, Thank it's you. fine. Uh, but yeah, it's just been, um, it, I just, I, this is just how it should be. I mean, yes, there are going to be, Fil I mean, we've talked about Filipino stuff this whole time, and yes, it's in there. But when you market the book as, this is the book about X, then it, it just, I think the whole bottom of the book will just fall out from underneath all of that pressure and all that weight and then then what do you have you know and so with invisible putting the filipino filipino stuff as i call it in there but not making it the point of the marketing it's it's just really maintained the book as as a complete entity which is just amazing and i love that i'm glad I'm glad. I mean, I will. I will. <laughs> I will say, as the person who acquired your book, I mean, one of the one of the things that really, really drew me to the manuscript in the first place, uh, on top of all the really, really great stuff and the fantastic story and and the things that I connected to personally, was the fact that it wasn't what. A, so, context. Um, I guess I grew up. Uh, sort of my formative education in Canadian literature uh, was a lot of, a lot of stuff published um, by, by, by writers of color or, or writers of, of other identities who, of marginalized identities who, and this isn't a knock on them because, you know, like ultimately what gets published is published because someone made a decision to publish it. But I found that a lot of the stories were, you know, they're struggle stories. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that like, the people who were acquiring these books and publishing these books said we're, we're saying well we have to you know these stories the, these types of stories by these kinds of people are the are the ones that matter mm -hmm. and so these are the only ones that we're going to publish or these are the ones that need to be published uh and well we've checked off that quota we've already got like five stories by yeah. poc yeah or we are so so we don't need to, so instead of like, you know, what, and thank God that the, you know, sort of the tide is turned on that now where, you know, uh, a murder mystery featuring uh, a Filipina, is she, is she made? Um, a murder mystery series featuring, um, oh geez, you were, you were reading it too. Oh, oh, Arsenic and Adobo. Yeah, Arsenic yeah, and Adobo, she... she's she works in a filipino restaurant yeah, yeah she works in a film yeah. filipino restaurant sorry i i haven't read the book so i don't okay. but like <laughs> that kind of book wouldn't be published because someone had written you know like there's already two books on the list about people fleeing you know a, a country that that a, a totalitarian country mm -hmm. or 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 a book about people you know just being wholly marginalized and experiencing all forms of oppression and i'm not saying that those those books aren't important they are mm -hmm. you know those stories need to be out there yeah. because we as we as people need to educate ourselves on 
what others are struggling with and how, in, you know, in, in order to be better allies, in order to be better people. Mm -hmm. But if those are the only stories that come out about us, and I'm using us in the, in the general sense, mm -hmm. then it, I think it, I think it leads to sort of, it leads to two things. Uh, it deprives it deprives people outside of those groups from the richness of 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 cultures that that otherwise they'd be privy to, right? Like, and and in a joyful light, as opposed yeah. to one based on struggle. But it also it also casts people of that identity as you know, like victims. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be victimized, but you are not a victim. Yeah, yeah, that was one thing that. I thought, you know, now that now we're talking about this, I think like in, in a lesser publisher, Freya's victimhood would be connected to her racial identity. And it it isn't at all. It's um you could make the argument that, you know, one influences the other in the way she feels and acts around people, but it's not she's a victim because she can see the future and she's also Filipino, you know. Um it's completely separate, those two things about her, which I love. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, those elements are in there for sure, because yeah. obviously, like, I mean, that's, that's, that's life, how, that's how we, that's how people treat each other, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I think, I think it was in your fold. I think someone asked, asked a question of you in, in, in your fold, in your fold event about like how, you know, where you drew inspiration from, or, or where you drew inspiration for how uh, the paradoxes are treated in, in your universe. Mm -hmm. And I think your response was something to the effect of, well, you know, we had like four years of Trump. We have yeah. all, you, just look around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just had to think for three minutes and there yeah. it was. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I had a point, so you, you, wrote, you wrote a point here about like, how can publishing be better at supporting marginalized voices? And I feel like I sort of answered that question yeah. is pick, pick better books not better but like different books pick more books you know there are I was going to make a grand sweeping statement but I won't I'll, I think I'll leave it at that it's just that there are more books and more kinds of stories that need to be told than just the ones that have been deemed important by people who aren't us yeah agreed and I think um Publishing is getting better at this now, but it's, I think it's important to remember that there are a wealth of a variety of voices in the world based on certain identities. And the ones that seem like they won't have maybe wide mass market appeal, fine. Then they won't have wide mass market appeal. It doesn't mean they won't have no appeal, you know? Um, and I think it's important to kind of take those, if they're perceived as risks in a publishing house, to take those risks and, you know, go off quota, <laughs> yeah. publish five books written by writers of color, you know, instead of four, see what happens. They'll probably be good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, the odds are pretty great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean that was a bit facetious, but I will I will say also that like um and 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 this is nothing to do with your book, but 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 like answering that question of like I mean I I alluded to the fact that like you know the stories that are deemed important by people who aren't us. I mean mm -hmm. there is something to be said about more people like us being in positions to pick books because I mean again yeah, like exactly. like a lot of the stuff that 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 rang true and really really hit a good nerve in me in your manuscript or things that would have just not affected or possibly not affected or meant anything to someone who didn't have our heritage, mm -hmm. for instance. And, you know, the book definitely wouldn't be what it is if you'd work with someone else. Yeah. Yeah, even, even if, I mean, I would not have worked with an editor who didn't respect my, what I had to say and everything, but it just, I can't even describe how, how nice it was to not have to like, it, 
backtrack and explain with context, oh, oh yeah, so a long salog is this, and it's important to our culture for this reason. And it's like, in the grand scheme of things, if I have to explain here or there, that's okay. But not having to, it was, it was just also so relaxed. It just made me feel so relaxed. I could, my mind was clear to talk about like the plot structure or the narrative or, or other things, you know? Um, yeah, so that's my, that's my rambling addition to your lovely point there. <laughs> I forgot what my point was. I feel like I've, <laughs> I feel like I said a bunch of stuff. Some of it might be taken out of context and be raked over the coals for it, but that's fine. That's life. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> um, with that, uh, speaking of not having to explain anything and all the lovely really the, the, the refreshing depiction of like what it means to be Filipino uh, in that society. <laughs> um, I guess that's my my sort of half-assed way of uh, introing or or uh, nudging you to maybe give us a bit more of a reading. Sure, you can do a Filipino one. Now, unlike the last um, excerpt, I won't give any preamble to this one. Just well, I will give one non-plot um, related preamble. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Brian and I layered in uh, past narrative chapters alternately. So this one does take place in the past and it's in third person if you're wondering why. Uh, Freya is about 20 years old here. The Spadina streetcar screamed on its rails. She returned home with takeout pierogies from Futures and opened a bottle of wine she'd been saving. Best to stay home in a nest of blankets on her bed, laptop propped up, stack of DVDs wobbling precariously on the uneven nightstand she'd found at the end of her street last summer. Start with the classics, maybe they'll be boring and relaxing. Breathless, breakfast at Tiff. oh wait, Mickey Rooney playing that racist Japanese character. Okay, a bit more modern. Can't go wrong with some Ferris Bueller's day off. Stay away from 16 Candles though, another racist Asian caricature. You should probably just throw those movies away. Fuck, I put on the Lord of the Rings trilogy and stop thinking about movies. Just throw the dinner stuff on the counter, ignore the clock, curl up and let the world slide away. Imagine a world more fantastical, where people with weird abilities are respected, spoken of reverently in hushed tones, are made members of important councils that make important decisions using unique insight that regular people simply don't have. Where people like me would go on adventures, quests that could change the world. Where could she go to escape on a quest of her own? Maybe the Philippines, the one she knew through her father's stories. Humid and hot, land of mythological creatures. Maybe she could meet a real Nuno Sapunso, gain its trust. Or maybe tame dad's favorite, the half-horse trickster Tikbalang. Or maybe she could go to Norway. The cold wind, the northern lights, the crackling quiet, the land of her mother and her name and her power. She shifted her legs, felt the air around her change grow hotter and then colder. How long had she not been alone? The shadowy figure in the corner of her small apartment filled her with dread, but also a strange comfort, a sense of inevitability. The stale taste of red wine gummed her mouth shut as she tried to greet it, but a greeting wasn't necessary. The shadow shifted as it moved, changed size. It turned from a half horse creature into a tiny old man his long beard trailing on the floor as he moved closer to Freya using a strange crouching hop. The Nuna touched Freya's wrist and she knew she had been cursed. The imprint of his hand flared and then he was gone. Ooh. I'm triggered, I'm triggered. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was the scene that really set me up. I have to say um, it speaks to your strengths as an editor that I did not know this about you, I think, until this week. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't mention anything. I didn't like lose my mind about the fact that you'd written about one of my worst childhood fears. <laughs> like looking up and seeing a tiny little man in the corner. Oh, no. Nah. Yeah. yeah. Turn the lights on. Yeah. <laughs> I had, oh, no, I had trouble. No, seriously. It was, it was, it was such an issue. I like, so, I, I had, um, it didn't help that I went in my late teens, early 20s. I had, I, I had sleep paralysis 
Oh yeah, me too. And just, and just being into like all that alien stuff did not help. No. Yikes. Well, um, I'm sorry and thank you. <laughs> That's it. No, no, it's good. It, it, it hit a nerve. Um, so we have a bit of time left and I think, uh, now is the time for, if anyone has any questions, we're, uh, Sam and I will be happy to answer them. So please enter them in the chat. Yeah. And thank uh, you to Kelvin for, uh, for all the, the lovely comments in chat. I, I really want to reply about the, the spam in the sandwich with a fried egg. Oh, I'm going to have that <laughs> maybe for lunch tomorrow. Oh, one of the <laughs> best sounds really good. One of the best sandwiches. Oh, no, the best sandwich I ever had was, um, uh, we went to, uh, uh, my wife and I, for our honeymoon, we went to Maui, and uh, there was this smokehouse next to the uh, to the marina. Oh, not the marina. Sorry, the aquarium. Uh, and I think it's called Beach Bums. Anyways, it was like a it was like a choose your own four meats sandwich, and they had smoked spam there. Oh man. Oh, oh, heaven in my mouth. So yeah, good. That sounds good. Um, yeah. So, uh, any questions, anyone? I got a question for you, Sam. Sure. What's next? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's, um, I'm still processing what it means to have just published a book. I say just, it's, I mean, it came out last month, but honestly, it feels like it's been much longer than that just because of how different my life is now and all the different things I've had to do and think about and talk about that. Um, I kind of want to just, I have been, I have been writing. I see Kelvin getting upset at me, but I have been writing. It's just, yeah, I don't know. I'm finding it hard to get back into the actual routine of it, but yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, things have unlocked from writing this book, not just with, uh, writing in general, but the kinds of things I want to say. So I'm excited to kind of expand on certain things in, in future work. We have a question from, uh, uh Mr. Andrew Forbes. Uh, can we hope for a short story collection? Oh, maybe. Um, I did write my very first uh, speculative fiction short story, which was published in the Quarantine Review recently. And I had so much fun writing that, probably more fun than I've had writing a short story ever. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say it's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, yeah, it'll be fun um tarot is a big thing in the i'm asking mm. a question again tarot is a big <laughs> thing in the book <laughs> um so like what's what's your background with tarot is it like do you read uh i do but i'm not i don't have everything memorized um i do have to have a, a reference guide with me while i'm doing some readings i um i was into it a lot when i was a teenager kind of fell out of it for most of my life until just around the time I started writing this book, actually, which was 2016. Um, and I don't remember if I made the conscious decision for Freya to be a tarot reader, or if it just kind of happened, but it felt natural and right. Um, so I, yeah, I kind of started reading again, just in researching uh, Freya's tarot stuff and just, I found it really fun to do anyway. So um, yeah, I haven't done it a whole lot since, since, uh, kind of finishing the manuscript, but I, I do, I do do it sometimes and I'm getting, I think I'm getting better at remembering what everything means, but yeah, well, the thing with tarot that's cool is once you kind of get like a small refresher about what things mean, then you can kind of take it from there and the, the cards just kind of reveal themselves to you a little bit and the story they're trying to say. So yeah, it's kind of fun. <laughs> Uh, a question from Calvin Kong. What was Freya's dad going to get at McDonald's? So there's a, there, I think it was, was it his birthday or Freya's birthday when she's a child? Oh, the McDonald's, his, her last the day McDonald's. of school. It was her last day of school yeah. and they celebrate by getting McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but specifically, because I know Calvin wants the specifics. Um, I don't, I actually don't know what Freya's parents got, but Freya got uh, nuggets I think a 10 piece I think it was just 10 but um she always asks for extra sauces and I think they were all sweet oh, yeah. and sour mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> because we can um, all agree not enough sauces is not it's no good you have to have more sauces than you'll think you'll need honey garlic honey garlic over here mm -hmm. um uh any further questions I guess uh maybe I'll pop one more sure uh, 
just waiting to see if anyone anyone else has any questions. Uh, I guess that's a negatory. Okay. Um, do you have anything to say about the book that we haven't we haven't covered? Hmm, that is a good question. Um, <laughs> so open ended. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it's fine. I just it's interesting because I've actually I haven't yet thought what I wish people would be asking me. So no, actually, I guess yeah, I'm sorry, but my answer is no. I don't know. <laughs> What was the editorial process? No, we we basically we basically so I mean I'll answer this for for anyone who's curious is that our editorial process was basically one giant Google Doc us working on different parts at different times and uh, me blowing up her phone at like two a.m. asking stupid questions <laughs> or or making stupid comments or like floating ideas that had nothing to do with anything and probably not even the book. I sent you one the other day. I don't oh, think it's going to happen. Yeah. It's so, <laughs> I, had, I, had, I had this insane idea that I was going to record, um, I was going to buy a wrestling video game. I was going to create uh, a bunch of characters based on like public domain literary figures. And I was going to make them fight in a tournament and like add like voiceover uh, with like literary, like literary trivia, but also just like over the top wrestling stuff. And then throw it up on YouTube and see if anyone actually watched it. Yeah, I think it's gonna go viral. That's awesome. No, it's <laughs> it's it. the it's the dumbest idea and I have books to edit. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, um although actually I, guess, I see a question that maybe maybe okay. you could answer. I can't. I Google. I Google oh, Tikbalang. But the Filipino myths, yeah. I Google same. Mananangal. <laughs> There's um oh uh that book. Well I guess yeah it's just there's a book in general about Filipino mythology, but not nothing to do specifically with the creatures that I liked. Was it by Ramos? Is that? Oh, it might be. I mean, Ramos is the guy who wrote that whole series of. It's called Filipino mythology, myth and folk, or something like that. I it's forget the one the with title. like the banana tree or something, right? Mm, I'm thinking of the another. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So I so Ram <laughs> Ramos is um. Oh oh, here's a good question. How much did your Finnish side influence your choice to include Nordic mythology? Thank oh, you, Miriam. Interesting question. Yeah, it's um. Thank you. Um. So I didn't want to make Freya exactly like me. Um. However, her her name, as I mentioned, just came up first, and her the thing about the the goddess Freya. And so I thought, okay, it, it's got to happen. She's got to be half Norwegian. Which is almost too bad because I thought once I, I decided to get to just thought think okay fine she'll be half uh, Nordic half Filipino I couldn't make her finish because Finns don't have the same um, mythology system as, as the, the Scandinavians do. However, it was um, it was interesting that there were lots of similar sort of maybe not so much with the mythology part but in in the parts of a Freya's mother character, there were a lot of cultural touch points that were the same between Finns and Norwegians, such as food, like uh, pickled herring and uh, things like that. Um, just the way Freya's mother is as a personality compared to her Filipino father were, were quite overall Nordic. Um, so unfortunately, uh, I couldn't put in as much Finnish, actual Finnish stuff as I wanted to. Um, simply because there's no real cultural similarity if you go as far back as uh, as like the mythology aspect of it. But uh, who knows, maybe maybe I can, actually there is a uh, sort of a Finnish mythology. So maybe I can, maybe that's my next idea. I can uh, go more into that, that would be fun. Oh, that, would, that would be really fun. I know that um, there's a lot of, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but there's, there's a lot of animism involved in Finnish mythology. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I would not be surprised. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Calvin says the Encyclopedia of Legendary Creatures, 1981, was a terrifying book. Too bad there isn't one for Southeast Asian mythology. So um, one of the things um, about working on this book that 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 uh, that really uh, triggered my curiosity was 
the mythology aspect of it and the Filipino mythology specifically. And, and I did a bit of deep diving and, and one thing, well, actually, no, uh, I, I did a bit of deep diving before uh, to, to sort of like when, uh, before my daughter was born, when we were looking for just a name that would, would be meaningful to her, just both on a personal level and on a cultural level. Um, I did a deep dive into the mythology. I want to look at the pre-colonial stuff specifically just to make sure that like that's there that represented but um one of the things I found out was um uh Philippine mythology is has is is kind of so it's always been sort of a nexus of like uh um different cultures just because of where it's situated uh in the world and and, and there's always been a whole bunch of people coming and going from there so so pre-colonial Philippine mythology is heavily inspired weirdly enough by like uh a lot of Indian mythology, um, but also, but the, also there are sort of like proto uh, Pacific Islander stuff in there. So like, so like um, beings like like Pele and and Maui and stuff. You'll you'll find uh, their sort of um, their equivalents in in Filipino myths if you if you look hard enough for them. I know definitely Pele. That's cool. I didn't know that actually. That's really neat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a whole thing. It's so neat. Um and and even 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 on the language side, apparently, like as much as um uh Tagalog has like a lot of influences from like other Asian cultures, there's also like at, at its root, there's a lot of Pacific Islander there because yeah. of the way human migration works. Apparently. Yeah. Yeah. It's popular. Um sorry, I just have to say, Miriam, that's awesome about the Kalavala. I oh I read that. It's it's amazing. And Oh, I hope you can, yes, I hope you can, oh, I'm so excited about this idea you're having. I want to read it. Hurry up and write it so I can read it, please. <laughs> uh, Kalavala with, uh, so that's the, the Finnish uh, national epic, um, the Kalavala. It's, uh, it's written in, um, sorry, this is, I know it's Filipino heritage month, but <laughs> so it's, um, uh, com um, what's the word? It's uh, someone went around and collected a bunch of oral histories and oral, um, origin stories and, and uh, creation stories. So the, the way it's written is very rhythmic because you know they had to remember it. So it's very lyrical. And uh, yeah, after I read that, the pattern of my thoughts was really strange for <laughs> a couple of weeks just because I was thinking this weird like meter, but definitely amazing material from, from lots of mythologies, I think. Yeah. Sorry, I just babbled about something completely unrelated. <laughs> No, it's good. So one of the things I was worried about is that like we wouldn't have we wouldn't be able to string together a really cohesive conversation. And th it is it is an hour and a half after start. We yes, have thank uh, you everyone for sticking with us. <laughs> good God. And, and and everyone's still here, which is amazing. Um yeah. I guess maybe we should wrap this up. So uh let's uh, let's let's do our our uh let's do our our thanks. Sam, yeah, thank you, you very much to Shelf Life and Glass Bookshop for having us. It's been so much fun and Thank you to Calgary <laughs> for giving me this mug, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and thank you to Brian. This was a lot of fun. <laughs>